Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. This tape shows the important steps in the waxing of an occlusal bite plane splint. The casts are mounted on a Hano H2 articulator. The advantage of using the Schuyler pin with the Freedom in Centric pin is that a flat area can be developed that allows for even contacts around the centric stops. The maxillary cast should be mounted in the articulator using a face bow. The mandibular cast may be mounted in either centric relation or centric occlusion. If possible, every case should be mounted with a centric relation registration. However, with many TMJ muscle pain dysfunction patients, it is impossible to obtain an accurate centric relation registration. In such cases, the mandibular cast can be mounted in centric occlusion. The case in this film has been mounted in centric occlusion because an accurate centric relation registration could not be obtained due to muscle splinting. The materials needed for waxing the splint are articulator with mounted casts, hard pink base plate wax and a medium hard blue inlay wax. Waxing instruments number seven, red handled and brown handled lab knives. Bunsen burner and bowl with hot water. Snow white impression plaster, rubber bowl and mixing spatula. Articulating paper, point zero 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 five shim stock zinc stearate powder and double-ended plate brush. The individual setting of the articulator. Setting of the incisal table. The incisal table should be adjusted in protrusive movements for slight contact of the anterior teeth. Move the upper member of the articulator in an edge-to-edge -edge position and turn the incisal table for contact with the offset pin. Check the clearance by making back and forth movements. In lateral movements, the lateral wings of the incisal table are adjusted for slight clearance between the cuspids on the working side or between the cuspids and posterior teeth if a group function is present. Move the upper member of the articulator until the cuspids are edge to edge and raise the lateral wings until there is contact with the incisal pin. Continue to raise the lateral wings until there is clearance between the cuspids approximately the thickness of one sheet of pink base plate wax. Adjust both sides the same way. Check for clearance by moving the upper member side to side. Setting the FC pin for freedom of centric. With the Hano H2 articulator, it is possible to adjust freedom of centric. The casts are held in centric occlusion. With a screwdriver, the FC pin should be raised to establish the desired amount of freedom in centric. For this splint, 0.5 millimeters freedom of centric is required. The exact amount of freedom can be measured directly on the FC pin with a ruler. To make sure that the proper freedom in centric has been adjusted, move the offset pin back and forth. 
The lateral aspect of freedom in centric is seen by making side-to-side -side movements. Setting of the vertical opening. The thickness of the bite splint is determined by adjustment of the offset pin. In order to have a flat surface on the splint, which facilitates waxing a freedom incentric, the offset pin should be lengthened until there is clearance between the maxillary and mandibular teeth. While raising the offset pin sight between the second molars, the articulator is tipped back and forth until there is a clear line of sight between the maxillary molar cusp tips and the mandibular molar cusp tips. This can be checked with a thin card or ruler. The least amount of vertical opening that allows for a smooth flat surface is ideal. Check for clearance in lateral and protrusive movements. setting of the congular guidance. The congular guidances are set reasonably parallel with the occlusal plane, but always more than zero degrees. A ruler should be held parallel to the lower occlusal surface and the horizontal congular guidance is adjusted. The setting is done on both sides. The lateral congular guidance is not set because lateral freedom is provided by proper setting of the FC pin. Outline and block out of undercuts. Mark the outline of the splint on the maxillary cast with a pencil. On the facial surface, the splint should be extended one to two millimeters cervically from the incisal edges of the anterior teeth. Extend to the height of contour on the buccal surface at the bicuspid and molars. The palatal extension is determined by the thickness of the gingival margin, the bony contours, and the rugae. The splint does not extend cervically to the height of contour on the distal of the second molar. Extend the splint four to five millimeters on the palatal tissue. Whenever possible, the line should be placed in the valleys between rugae and never cross the incisal papilla. The splint should extend just beyond the free gingival margin and the attached gingiva. One to two millimeters of coverage on the anterior teeth is sufficient for retention, yet is aesthetically acceptable. The extension to the height of contour on the posterior teeth provides adequate retention. The extension of the splint on the palatal tissue is for comfort. Block out of undercuts. A thin mix of impression plaster is painted into all palatal interproximal areas and all palatal undercuts. All deep occlusal grooves and lingual embrasures should be filled with plaster. Never cover the cusps with plaster, nor extend the plaster to the pencil line.
the lingual concavities of the incisors should be covered too. Lightly cover the incisive papilla with a blockout plaster to reduce pressure from the splint in this area. It is important not to block out the interproximal areas on the buccal surfaces because they are for retention. Only large ones should be filled. The inspection of the blockout shows no plaster extending to the penciled outline. All cusp tips are free of plaster. The incisal papilla is lightly covered. The lingual concavities of the incisors are filled. The buccal embrasures are free of plaster. Waxing the splint. A layer of hard pink base plate wax should be uniformly heated in a bowl of hot water or by using a Bunsen burner. It is then adapted evenly to the cast with the fingers or a moistened gauze pad. Trim any excessive wax which extends outside the pencil mark. Trimming should be done while the wax is still warm and soft. Close the articulator and observe the relationship between wax and teeth. Usually more base plate wax is required in the anterior region than in the posterior region. A second piece of base plate wax is now heated uniformly. It is folded to about 10 millimeters in width and to a thickness which will fill the observed interproximal space. Mold the strip into a U-shape and heat the wax with a Hano torque to adapt the layer of wax to the maxillary surface. Continue to heat and seal the two wax layers with a number seven spatula until they are completely sealed, both on the buccal and lingual surfaces.
lock the conjular element and heat the occlusal wax surface thoroughly. When the wax no longer appears shiny, close the articulator until the incisal pin is in contact with the table. Open the articulator and make sure that all teeth have made contact with the wax. If no contact is present, add more wax in the deficient areas. When all contacts are present and the wax is hardened, Trim away excessive wax to reduce any deep indentations. Trimming can be done with a laboratory knife or by heating the occlusal surface with a number seven spatula. As soon as most of the excessive wax has been cut away, our articulating paper can be used to mark the contacts. The occlusal surface should be as flat as possible. Smooth and flatten the wax between the marks and also to the lingual and buccal border of the splint. As splinting muscles relax, the patient will close into a different centric position. The flat occlusal surface will maintain more even occlusal contact than an irregular rough surface. A flat area one millimeter behind the centric stops of the lower incisors should be provided in case the centric stops move posteriorly as the muscles relax. Wax removal should continue until just the mandibular cusp tips contact the surface. Normally, all the mandibular buccal cusps will make contact with the splint unless the cusps are unusual heights where there is intrusion, extrusion, or mesial distal tipping of the teeth. Waxing the cuspid guidance. To eliminate protrusive and balancing interferences, a cuspid rise is placed in the splint. Close the articulator and make some marks on the wax to indicate the position where the cuspid rise will be placed. 
These lines should include areas for lateral as well as protrusive movements. At the periphery of the marked line, a small amount of medium hard inlay wax is placed. Add heated wax step by step so that lateral and protrusive movements will all be guided by the cuspid rise. The border of the cuspid rise should reach the outline of the splint. As soon as the wax loses its liquid state, create paths of movement in the soft wax by manipulating the upper member of the articulator into protrusive, lateral, and lateral protrusive excursions. The total guidance surface of the cuspid rise has to be functional. There should be no anterior and posterior interferences in protrusive and balancing. Sterate powder is used to show the contacts on the cuspid rise. There should be simultaneous, continuous straight lines on both cuspid rises in protrusive. There are also continuous straight lines in lateral movements to the left and right. If the guidance lines show an interruption in their continuity, more wax should be added in those areas. In this case, we had to add some wax at the right cuspid rise because the guidances are too short. At the left cuspid rise, we had to remove some wax because the lateral guidance was too heavy. Repeat this procedure as often as necessary. The final guidance on the cuspid rise is marked with sterate powder. In the protrusive movement, the cuspid guidances appear similar with continuous straight bilateral lines. A continuous straight line is also necessary for both lateral movements. Between the two marked lines, the total guidance surface of the cuspid rise has to be functional. In making a lateral movement to the right, make sure the incisors do not make contact with the cuspid rise. The view from the lingual shows the disclusion by the cuspid rise in the right lateral movement. It should provide about one millimeter separation in the molar region. In the protrusive movement, the guidance should be similarly made on the mesial cusp ridge of both mandibular cuspids. Make sure that there are no anterior contacts in protrusive and lateral movements. In making a left movement, the left cuspid rise is checked. All movements are guided by the adjusted incisal table and the waxed cuspid rises. Once again, guidance should be done by the mandibular cuspid on the cuspid rise. Often overlooked are interferences in the molar region, which should be removed when present. Around the centric stops, freedom of centric is required. By moving the offset pin on the adjusted FC pin, the amount of freedom in centric is seen. Contact should be present in all freedom of centric positions. Movements in any direction should display a freedom of centric of approximately 0.5 millimeter before the cuspid guidances take over for disclusion. Final design and check of the wax splint before processing in acrylic. The thickness of the splint should be minimal to reduce tongue encroachment. The contour on the palatal side follows closely the anatomic contours of the teeth and the palate.
The wax should be trimmed to the penciled outline and sealed to the cast. Carefully examine the occlusal wax surface to make sure there are no dimples in centric stop areas. All surfaces where supporting cusps make contact must be smooth and flat. Smoothness of non-contact areas is also important. Interproximal facial areas should be filled with wax for retention. Seal the entire margin of the waxed splint to the cast. The facial thickness is about one millimeter in wax. The buccal surface of the wax should be void of angular characteristics by carving it so that it approximates the contour of each posterior tooth. The facial contour of the cuspid rise should follow the contour of the cuspid. The wax should be trimmed to the penciled outline or slightly beyond to allow for trimming and polishing of the acrylic after processing. The final result shows a smooth, flat surface. The total guidance surface of the cuspid rise has to be functional. Behind the centric stops of the lower incisors, a flat area from about one millimeter is provided. At the cuspid rise, the freedom of centric is seen as a flat area between the centric stop of the cuspid and the elevation of the cuspid rise. Whenever the waxing covers rugae, the final line should end in the valleys between rugae. Check for contact of all centric stops with shim stock. Make all possible movements to be sure that the wax up is correct. The cast is now removed from the plaster mounting and sent to the laboratory with instructions for processing in a heat cured acrylic. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. 
For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.